Welcome back to Inside Horror Season 3. We have all returned, luckily, all three of us. Uh, we've had a great summer. I hope you enjoyed your summer off. I was uh, drinking daiquiris by the pool with Mitt Romney. It's been a good time. Uh, <laughs> joining me, as always, are my co-host, first, Stacey Lane Wilson. Why, hello. I have returned, indeed. Did you have a good summer? I did. I had a great summer. I actually uh, got to channel summer, summer excuse me, by um, directing a rock video for The Ventures, Surf Rock Sensations. So, yes, I had a lot of uh, good times. I had no idea you did that. I did, so, indeed, yeah. So that's Shockingly, awesome. Shockingly, I know you have nothing to do with it, Mr. I Producer. It. <laughs> and also joining us again... Um, and this is crazy uh, because on the way here, something very special happened to her in traffic. Rebecca McKendry in the chat room. <laughs> Tell them what happened. What's up? So apparently on the way here, I just got knocked up. Immaculate wow. conception. We don't know what happened. I was just driving here and I was a size four. And by the time I arrived at the studio, I've got this massive baby bump that is a boy and due in March. My so, theory um, is that the chat room, somebody is responsible from the chat room last season, <laughs> Elvira episode, someone talked dirty to her, and that's how it happens. Um, anyway, I think that's awesome. The coolest thing is in our final episode, just after Halloween, she is going to give birth live on air. I'll and it's going to be hot. I'll right? see what I can do. We may, have to charge, we may have to charge people for that okay, episode, okay. darling. <laughs> or you could just like, watch It's, it's alive. alive part yeah. three or something. <laughs> like, just watch It's Alive. Um, okay, well, we, uh, we're really excited to be back for season three. We, uh, we're trying a few new things this season, uh, but we're, you know, great guests and chat, as always. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to the minds behind The Devil's Carnival. We're going to have uh, Darren Lynn Bowsman and Terrence Zdunich in probably about 15 minutes coming on. So please keep firing in your questions. Uh, Becca, how can they get their questions to us? Well, right now you can head to youtube.com slash the stream TV. I am there and we have got a group of carnies, yes, Devil's Carnival fans with us, lighting up the chat. So keep it coming, guys. Join us. You can also catch us on Facebook at Inside Horror. And we're here and I'm ready to read your questions. Bring them on. So we've been off air for about two months, I think. So we've missed quite a few of the horror films. Uh, we have some great movies coming out in the next two months. Um, but I just wanted to quickly go around and what, what did you guys think about, say, like, let's start with The Possession, which came out. It's been number one for three weeks, I think, until this last week. Wow, really? Well, I guess I must be a taste maker because I actually like The Possession. I thought, even though the story was nothing special. I mean, it's something that we've seen uh, approximately a bazillion times. I did think that the character development was really good, and I enjoyed the jump scares, and I thought it was pretty well done. One of, one of the uh, better, I think it was PG-13, definitely mm -hmm. one of the better PG-13 movies that I've seen in quite a while for the horror genre. Did you see the one bigger? I did. I actually really liked um, Possession. I'd seen it right after I saw Apparition, and I was not a fan of Apparition right. Right. at all. So anything after that was yeah. terrific. It was like, by comparison, Possession <laughs> is awesome, you know, compared to Apparition. So I actually really liked Possession. I thought that, you know, the plot had a couple kind of cheesy moments, but mm -hmm. overall, it definitely scared me in a couple of moments. So I definitely check it out. It's like, I think it's a good message to Hollywood that if you have material that's kind of B material and you hire an A director, they can make something really unique out of it. Because that director made a really good film, I'm not sure if he's Norwegian or Swedish, uh, called Just Another Love Story. And it was really good, like a noir, a noir love story. And you could tell the guy had chops. And so to, for Sam Raimi to hire someone like that, I think it's great because the material to me was fairly average. But there's moments of directing that were like reminding me of The Shining or something. There were really nice little moments here or there. So I thought, anything else that you guys saw while we're off? Um, I actually really, really enjoyed Livid, which is the French thriller from the directors of Inside. And it's like a horror art film. It's very balletic. It's a vampire film. Um, I actually saw it without any captions or subtitles, and I don't speak French, but I was able to follow the story. And it was just really captivated by the visuals. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. It kind of reminded me, actually, of um, some other balletic horror films, like The Red Shoes or um, Suspiria or even... Uh, 
uh, Guy Madden's uh, Dracula, Pages from a Virgin's Diary, which is one of my favorites. So if you really like arty horror, I strongly recommend Livid, even though you can't get it in the U.S. <laughs> Big you can, you can snag it. Yeah, I think, so. I think well, the problem is America's going to, someone's going to remake it here, so they're probably ah, trying to make uh. the film not come out so they can just remake it, gotcha. uh, unfortunately. But it is. I, th I saw it with subtitles, but... Uh, you know, you didn't need the subtitles. But it was very beautiful. It, it did remind me of an... It's definitely art house. I think my comment was somebody's been smoking too much Gene Rowland uh, afterwards because it felt very <laughs> That much might have like, been me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you see anything interesting, Beck? Actually, I really liked The Pact. And The Pact hasn't come to a DVD release yet. Um, it's available on iTunes for purchase right now. It's also available on Amazon. And this is one that kind of snuck up on me. It was recommended by um, one of my Fango cohorts, Leanne Spider Baby, um, when I was talking about how I couldn't find any really good ghost films. And she mm. said, check out The Pact. And it's you, you kind of have to get over the low production values at first, but as soon as you're over that, it's really good. So check it out, The Pact. The Pact's mostly famous for... Um the actor eating ice cream. That's mm -hmm. the guy from Starship <laughs> yeah. Troopers. Ice cream eating scene, it's hot. I think we talked about it last night. Well, let's, uh, let's move on. We have uh, the victim. We had uh, Jennifer Blanc and Michael Bean on the show last season, or it might have been the season before. Finally, their film, The Victim, has hit DVD and Blu-ray today. Uh, and, Becca, we have a special giveaway that's going to happen soon, right? Yep, we do. We have got two copies of the Blu-ray and two copies of the DVD. Did I get that right, Elric? I think so. It's signed by everyone. Signed by everybody. This means Michael Bean. This means Jennifer. This means the entire cast and crew. So everybody is going to be signing it. And you can win these through us. We're going to have details up on our Facebook page within a couple of days on how you can win these awesome prizes. So just keep checking back at the Facebook page, and we'll get you entered. Yeah, so that's going to be fun, and it's available for purchase if you want to go. If you don't like your chances of winning, <laughs> go buy it. It's on Amazon and everywhere right now. Uh, so this week, uh, what we wanted to do was take in for our faves, we wanted to talk about our favorite cinematic depictions of hell, because uh, obviously uh, our guest tonight decided to locate hell in a carnival setting, which is very interesting. So we're just going to round Robin quickly and just talk about our favorite depictions. Feel free on the chat to send in what some of your favorite movies are. Uh, we can't mention uh, as many as we'd like. So uh, we'll start with Becca. What's your favorite cinematic depiction of hell? My favorite depiction of hell is not actually one that most people would look at and be like, oh, that's hell. And that's Event Horizon. And this movie came out in 1997. Um, it's directed by Paul Anderson, who is most well known for doing the Resident Evil series. And it's pretty much a space crew is sent to investigate this ship that went through a black hole and came out on the other side empty. So there's nobody on it living, supposedly. And this crew has sent his recon to go find out what's going on with the ship and why it came back and, you know, research it because it survived a black hole. And what they discover is that what's in the black hole is not what they expected and that it came back with them on the ship. Um, this movie scared the shit out of me when I first saw it. Um, I saw it in a theater in 1997 when it first came out. So scary. So definitely check it out, Event Horizon. And it has the best actor in the whole world. Sam Neill. Yes, it does. It has Sam Neill. And people have actually said it's Mouth of Madness in space. Totally, totally. So, yeah. It's and and uh, for all, I actually was going to choose that one, too. Uh, we'll get to my pick in a second, but I was, I was thinking of End Horizon as well. It's a great film. So, mm -hmm. uh, Stacy, what about you? Ah, well, if I have to pick a cinematic depiction, I couldn't pick uh, Reaper, which is my favorite, the TV series with Ray Wise as the devil and the DMV is hell. But uh, actually, I saw The Beyond, Lucio Fulci's The Beyond, with Mr. Bill Mosley sitting right next to me. So, I mean, I have to love that film. Um, and it does have the greatest um, cinematic depiction of hell because they go into this really bizarre painting, which kind of reminds me of also uh, Dario Argento's Stendhal syndrome, mm. not to be confused with the Stockholm syndrome, which uh, brings to mind another great film with Linda Blair uh, called Sweet Hostage. <laughs> Remember that one, you Whoa, guys? Whoa, that's just so random. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's just like leave. always like six <laughs> degrees of separation from Linda Blair for me. Okay. That's just sad. <laughs> and the chats are lighting up with people telling us their favorite oh, depiction good. of hell um, and their favorite devil. And we're seeing a lot of Tim Curry's legend oh, well, coming we're up. Gonna tell them we're going to get to Tim Curry's talk. We will ask them about Tim Curry. Don't worry. <laughs> He's coming back. And uh, everybody is saying the Devil's Carnival is their favorite depiction well, of good. hell. That's good. That's why, we, that's why they're here. 
Um, I went I went total art house uh, because Event Horizon w was one of my. I also think Barton Fink's really interesting because uh, a very LA story and very kind of realistic. But yes. and what me, what dreams may come is another uh, more art house film. But I went with uh, there's a film by Igmar Bergman who everyone knows is the big art house director. He made a film called Hour of the Wolf, and I would say it's the best nightmare film. Uh, ever made outside of anything David Lynch did, it's it's the best. It's terrifying. This clip you're going to see is very visually bizarre and creepy uh, with this woman as she peels off her face, as you're watching right now. Mm -hmm. uh, this film is basically saying that hell is mental illness, and that mental illness is as close as we can get to a personal hell. It's about a painter on an isolated uh, island who suffers these intense nightmares. And the whole film is just basically this person suffering these nightmares, and that becomes their own kind of personal hell. And I think, I think for me, without believing necessarily in, in religion, an orthodox kind of religion, I think hell would be losing one's mind. And this film is creepy. Uh, don't be put off by it if, if you're not into art house directors. It is genuinely a terrifying little film. And a lot of people haven't seen it. It's actually on instant uh, Netflix Instant. So if you want to check it out, I would highly recommend that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many good ones. Like Flatliners, even is another example. I know. Oh, yeah. Personal yeah, no, no. hell. But know? actually, though, I do. I own um, Hour of the Wolf on DVD, and I have to say that yes, that is truly not just a great film, but an ac absolutely perfect Creepy. depiction of hell. Yeah. And I, mean, I know David Lynch of, uh, loved it. Right. I mean, people think of like the depiction of the devil in a Ber uh, in a Bergman film as the Seventh Seal, but really, right. you know, the Hour of the Wolf is the one. Well, we make our own, yeah, we make our own hell, that kind of concept. But that's just a different one. Um, so one thing we're going to do, uh, moving on, and we definitely want to hear more of your responses, and we'll uh, talk about them at the end of the show. Uh, each week uh, in this new season, what we're going to do is we're going to ask uh, vloggers and bloggers from other horror websites um, and other directors and people like that. We're going to ask them, give them about a minute, minute and a half to film themselves telling us the film that meant the most to them, the horror film that is, has the most importance to them. It doesn't need to be their favorite. Uh, so to kick off this season, we uh, talked to uh, one of the personalities in the horror blogosphere called Jill Kill. And uh, she gave us a really interesting, uh, you know, definitely my favorite film, too. Uh, she gave us an interesting answer. So come and check it out. J Jill Kill Hello, on Darkling. The Shining. My name is Jill Kill, and my most important horror film is The Shining. Um, I've always been a huge Stephen King fan. And I read Firestarter when I was a little girl because, you know, I thought it was a book about a little girl. And, you know, it, of course, that's not all that it's about. But it got me uh, turned on to Stephen King. And so I read The Shining next. And I thought that was just an amazingly weird book. And so a few years later at a slumber party, I saw the movie. And I was really excited to see the movie and thought that it would be just like the book. But it wasn't at all. It was just such a creepy, insane film. And I'd never seen a movie by Stanley Kubrick before. And I swear, every other girl at the slumber party was asleep. And I was just sitting there watching this film, you know, that crazy look of horror on my face, I'm sure exactly like Danny had, where it's just, oh my god, this movie's so insane. And, I don't know, that movie really started me loving horror in a new way, and also turned me on to one of the most amazing directors who ever lived, Stanley Kubrick. And so, that's why it's one of my most important horror movies. Um, thanks for asking me this question. My name's Jill Kill. Uh, bye. So that was awesome. Thanks, Jill, for that. Um, and next week, we're going to have one of our favorite filmmakers, uh, especially short filmmakers, uh, Drew Daywalt, who also has a great blog at Fearnet. He's going to be telling us about his most significant horror film. So uh, now we're now I know you're all eagerly awaiting our great guests, and it'll only be a couple more minutes. They have such a great fan base. Uh, first, we're going to go to Becca. Mm -hmm. uh, Toronto Film Festival was just last week. Fantastic film festivals next week. That's why I'm wearing this T-shirt from Austin. Uh, it's going to be there's going to be some great stuff premiering there. But let's quickly recap because some of the films we've really been eagerly anticipating played last week. So Becca, tell us what's the early word on some of these great movies coming out. Yeah, so today for the news, we're looking at some of the films that played at Toronto International Film Festival last week. Now, um, TIFF has kind of become a really good kind of hunting ground for horror that will be coming up in the next year. So today we're looking at five different films that have played at TIFF and kind of looking at how the, the critics have looked at them and then what the fate of them has been. So first up is the one that everybody has been talking about, and this is Lords of Salem, Rob Zombie's new film. This film has been incredibly polarizing in its reviews that it's gotten from TIFF, where even within the horror media, some people have said that it's absolutely beautiful, arty, hallucinogenic, and a lot of other horror sites have said that, you know, it's too arty, and it's Rob Zombie trying to, you know, make a very pretentious film that he's just not ready for. I know one site I read um, even compared it to if Rob Zombie was trying to be Roman Polanski. So it's been 
really a mix of ups and downs. So I'm still excited to see it. I know most Rob Zombies fans are still salivating to see this one. Well, luckily, it got distribution. Anchor Bay has picked it up, so we should have some release information soon. Next up, we have ABCs of Death, and this is another one that horror fans have been really intrigued by. This is 26 different films. It's an anthology film. It's an anthology uh, series of films, actually. 26 different filmmakers doing this. It's also gotten mixed reviews. A lot of people are comparing it to VHS, where some of the films in it are top-notch, really hold it together, and other ones just kind of seem like they're fleshing out the time in between the good ones. But at the same time, most of the reviews I've read definitely say that horror fans should check it out. Even though that it's got some not so good films in it, it's worth it for the great ones. Now, uh, Becca, just, what if what if some of the fans said about the tea? Wasn't that the one that was the contest? I have not heard about the That's tea toilet. yet. Hmm. Tell me. Uh, it, that one was one. That was one by a claymation animator, and it's ah. beautiful. But that one was available before. But the one that the reason I just interrupted was because I think Stacy. There's a great film that me and Stacy both love called A Mare. Yes. Uh, oh yeah. And everyone's been saying that the directors of that have the one of the best ones. Them, Adam Wingard. And maybe the guy who made Hobo with a Shotgun are three of the ones I've heard really great things mm -hmm. about their. Oh, segments, beautiful! So. I mean, it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, Paris Shatam, which right, was right. also a, a, an amalgamation of many different filmmakers working on the same theme. Very short, short. A lot of, of different films, though. So uh, maybe for the horror art set. <laughs> this yeah, is, I mean, in the uh, defense you know, of the people making something it, for everybody. it's cool that they gave them complete artistic freedom. Yes, yeah, they I mean, did. it might it might hurt the film. Who knows? But like, you have five <laughs> minutes and a letter. Go. I mean, that's pretty cool. I, I think I'm, it's a great idea. I'm, it definitely makes me curious. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the list of people involved in this project, both the directors, the producers, and the actors and actresses in these things, is absolutely amazing. You should definitely check out the film. Just read the IMDb page. It sounds just wonderful <laughs> to see the right. people who are involved. Next up, we have Aftershock, produced by Eli Roth. Um, and the plot behind this one is an American tourist is traveling in Chile when an earthquake happens and a prison gets messed up in the earthquake and all of the prisoners break out and kind of go on a wave of violence throughout the area where this tourist is. Most of the reviews on this have been more on the negative side, saying that it really quickly goes from a good disaster flick into a bad torture porn. But some people have been saying that it does have really good effects, that it is really intense, and that it does have really good gore. This has already been picked up by Dimension, so that makes a little sense if it's hmm. a little bit more on the intense side. Fourth film we have up this week from TIFF is The Bay, and this is one that I cannot wait to see because the plot sounds really, really cool. It's directed by Barry Levinson, who was kind of one of the kings of the 80s with Rain Man and Good Morning Vietnam and Toys and a ton of other films. He's back directing The Bay, which is a found footage horror film. What the praise has been about this is even though that it's found footage, it's a very different style of presenting found footage where it's not just one style of found footage, the whole thing. It jumps. It's a cell phone video. It then goes to a video camera. It then goes to security footage. So it jumps all around. And all of these cameras are mixed together to tell the story about a parasite that invades a coastal town in uh, Maryland. Supposedly, it's incredibly gory because the parasite actually eats people from the inside out. And um, this one has gotten really positive reviews across the board. It's already been picked up by Lionsgate. And then the last one that we're going to talk about tonight is Here Comes the Devil. This is a Mexican horror flick. It's directed by the same person who did Penumbre last year. And the story is, while on vacation in the Tijuana Hills, children Rodolf, Adolfo and Sarah wander away from their parents and never return. Their parents are fretting, they go home, they're you know mourning the loss of their children, when suddenly their children return. But they don't return as themselves, they return completely different. This is another one that has gotten rave reviews pretty much across the board. I've read very few negative ones about this. I know on Fangoria, we gave it a four out of four. Chris Alexander absolutely loved it. Um, and this one is slated for distribution from MPI. Yeah, it looks fun. His previous films have always had a, a tone of comedy to the horror, which mm -hmm. maybe didn't capture me quite as much, but you could tell he had chops, so I'll be curious if this is a straight horror film. Yeah, and I've heard that the filming on this is really different. Um, Elric, mm. I know we were talking oh, about yeah. this before the show began, where supposedly it's, it's the camera is very fluid, constantly moving around, whip pans, turns, you know, the camera just follows people without stopping. So Sounds fun. I'm kind of excited to see that. 
Well, without further ado, uh, our guests tonight are the duo behind the cult hit Repo the Genetic Opera, and Darren Limbausman, of course, directed a number of the Saw films. Uh, they've recently been touring like rock stars uh, with their new collaboration, The Devil's Carnival. Uh, we're going to be joined by director Darren Limbausman and Terence Zadunich in one minute, but first we are going to watch the trailer to their Blu ray DVD release. Here it is. <laughs> You've heard my hymns. You've suited up for my crusade. And now, finally, you can take my carnival home with you. 666. 666. We're putting heaven out of business. Get ready for war. That's right. The Carnies and I have been spinning our fairest wheels to bring you the hottest features south of heaven, including commentary tracks, fiendish footage never before witnessed by mortal eyes, and a road tour featurette starring you, my most loyal congregation. That's so boss. <laughs> In heaven, my regards. You can't help but fall. You can't help but fall. You can't help but fall. Where is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, fuck <laughs> Please. You. you can swear. I, we just were talking about You can swear. Yes. Trust us. <laughs> yes. So I, I fucking present you with <laughs> that was, that was yeah. <laughs> and uh, Darren Lynn Bowsman. So you two, how does it feel to have survived the tour? Was it really forty plus cities? Sixty. Oh, oh my gosh. <gasps> But yet we but come who's on, counting? and you start with a swear word, and you pronounce both of our names correctly. So we're off to uh, yeah, that's good. a good homecoming. Yes, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, yeah, we did sixty cities, and um, it got to a point that I think we forgot where we were a lot of the times. Like you told the thing, uh, looking at your room keys, and like where where are we tonight? It was. Yeah, I, mem I remember there was one incident in a hotel where you know we've been traveling all night. We had a late night show. Got back to the hotel. I'm like excited to check into my room and crash and I reached into my pocket and I pulled out like a deck of hotel key cards. <laughs> no. and I'm like I have no idea which one is for tonight. It's a straight <laughs> And I thought about just sleeping in the hallway and it would have been fitting for the Devil's Carnival. <laughs> Rather than try every key. Uh, yeah, too let's, much work. Yeah, exactly. uh, let's go back to start. So what was the, uh, we'll start with the creative inspiration for an afterlife musical, uh, you know, which essentially it is. What was that inspiration for you? An afterlife, you meaning to repo? Yeah. No, no, no. The afterlife. <laughs> literally. The afterlife. Yeah. Literally yeah. making. I, I guess. I guess I'm not recovered from the road trip yet. Uh, <laughs> you just got off the bus right now. Yeah. Today, right. Like you've been, everyone else left, but you slept there for a few. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, dear. Oh. Sorry, I was, um, I'm getting questions while you guys are talking about your recovery. Um, we keep hearing about Darren's nose injury on the chats. <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. so it was the last night of, uh, we were, not last night, San Francisco. Yeah. We were in San Francisco, and uh, I, uh, we did a Q&A at the very end, and I hear them say, okay, Terrence and Darren, welcome Terrence and Darren, and everyone's clapping. And I realized that we didn't have the microphone, so I ran out to grab the mic, and I'm running. I'm in a sprint. I'm running back. And as right when I'm hitting the door, a fan on the other side kicks in the door, like just kicks it in right as I'm leaning forward. Oh, no. So it knocks me. I mean, I got knocked. I got knocked the fuck out. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I literally woke up and I'm being shook awake. And then I hear Terrence talking down there. I was like, Ugh! and I ran down the thing and I'm bleeding. Like my nose is bleeding. And I did the uh, I did the Q and A and uh, <laughs> pretty badass. We ended up going to the emergency room after that. I had a concussion, uh, broken nose, but uh, yeah. It you get, happens. Do you get insured for an indie film like this? Absolutely not. Oh, <laughs> oh Jay. Do you have insurance? insurance? I know. I hate your... Maybe whiskey or some JD. Yeah. That, was the, uh, that was the insurance. So creative inspiration, Terrence. <laughs> creative inspiration. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think, firstly, Darren and I have been talking for a few years now about wanting to do another dark musical project mm -hmm. um, and wanting to grow from whatever we learned uh, from doing Repo together. And... Uh, we had been talking about the idea of a heaven and hell story pretty much since we first met. Um, when Darren and I met 
on Repo, the stage play, actually, Darren directed the very first version of that hmm. in 2002, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, he talked about this idea of, uh, of a musical set in hell. At that time, Aesop fables and all the other things weren't part of it. So I think uh, we love that world. I think we love the idea of cautionary tales, particularly cautionary tales put to music. Hmm. So I think that was the impetus, and it just sort of grew and grew and grew into the monstrosity that it is well, today. I think one of the things that's <laughs> got to be known about it, it started when Terrence and I talked about it, we were going to do like this really kind of small interstitial thing that in between our features. So we're like, we can't make another repo right now. Let's just go make a short film. Yeah. And that short film was, let's make a YouTube short film. That was all it was going to be. And then uh, two songs became four, four became six, and then it became kept growing and growing. Our budget stayed the same, but the uh, the idea kept getting bigger and bigger. And then we eventually just shot it and said, you know, this is a little, this is a little more ambitious than just a, sh a short film. And the tour grew in that way as well. Um, we sort of got the idea to travel like a real carnival. Uh, we did it with Repo uh, back in 2008, but it was very small. It was like seven cities here, five cities there. And we decided with this, let's go all in and pray. And it works out that there's still an audience for this sort of. To whom dark... did you pray? Well, our dark lord and master. Since I did play Lucifer, I suppose Hail. it's a little ostentatious to Hail's, hail myself. Hail Satan. <laughs> Tim Curry. You prayed to Tim Curry. Yeah. Oh, everybody like in the real. chat is hailing Terry. Hailing Satan. So like, apparently that um, works. One Thank of, you. One of our uh, favorite. We have the DVD coming out, and one of my favorite uh, kind of features in the DVD is this: we do this road show part, and it basically features all of our fans. And uh, every night, and I know you guys get to see it and come out and see it, but uh, every night we ask the audience to stand up and throw the horns up and scream, Hail Satan. And <laughs> nothing beats an audience full of 600 people screaming, Hail Satan. Little kids, parents, adults, <laughs> teenagers. And the set was incredible. I mean, the set was not a small mm -hmm. indie film. You guys had, I mean, it might have yeah. been shot like it, but you guys had a great space down there. We, uh, yeah, when we shot the movie, we had a, a great production designer, this guy Derek, um, who, I, I mean, he turned mountains around it of what's the thing mountains out of molehills I, I don't know <laughs> it was good he was yeah. awesome you um, know uh, for those who don't know we were indeed lucky enough to actually visit the set of the devil's carnival and mm -hmm. we got to uh, uh, play amongst the uh, carnies which was great Broken and Becca was there and, too yeah it was yeah. really amazing but I want to know you guys now you've both worked with studios previously so what's been the difference in DIY filmmaking and I mean, I'm sure it's much more difficult, but how is it more satisfying? Um, I think for me, I mean, it's, it's Terrence and I were kind of complaining on the way over here that we wake up at, at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. and you, you, have, you have your day set out. You're like, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to watch a movie, I'm going to do an hour and a half of emails, I'm going to read a script. Mm -hmm. And then you wake up and you, you, your, your inbox is flooded with things that you, you thought as a filmmaker you never have to deal with, insurance certificates, ah, SAG residuals, yeah. things that you're having to, uh, all of these things, and the next thing you know you start on them and then it becomes 4 o'clock in the afternoon and you haven't done anything mm -hmm. except do the paperwork that they normally would do. And I think that's where... I took for granted when I was doing the Saw movies, um, you know, I didn't have to deal with that. It was about directing a movie. That being said, I had no control when they made the Saw movies or any movies, like on the trailer, on the key art, on any of that. I think what's great about what we're doing is we have control. It's us. Everything you see starts and stops with our team of people that we've put in place. Um, the bad part is everything falls on us as well. And that means literally today having a, a panic attack about clearances and things like that, which you just take for granted that you, someone else does, someone else's job. Well, not in the case of Devil's mm, Carnival. Right. It's, it's our job. So mm -hmm. there's no department to give it to? Uh, there's not. And I think that, I mean, it's, it's just something as simple as, so the, the disc comes out on October 23rd, and the amount of paperwork um, that is consuming, I mean, it's literally thousands of contracts that we have to we have to go through and review and then send off and it's yeah, wow. you know it, it's it's intense it's it's insane but creatively you don't need to get anyone do, else to stamp it no and no. that's and and I think it's not only I think it shows in the work that you know this is something a studio probably wouldn't get behind mm -hmm. but also the quickness the speed with which we can produce the work and get it out to the people like, I know Darren's directed a few films that have taken a couple years after finishing to reach the audience. Um, just because of studio bureaucracy or mm -hmm. trying to find a buyer or whatever the case may be. Um, we shot this January 11th of this year, and we were touring it in front of audiences on that 60-city tour we were talking about in April. And now it's September, and we're working on the DVD. So in eight months' time, we basically shot a film, Recorded it all across the country like a album. concert, recorded an album, 
and are now going to be sharing it with the world. And it's pretty exciting, and that sort of timeline would never have happened right. with a major studio. Well, no, you look at something like Mother's Day, a movie that I was insanely proud of, that literally, I think, from start to finish, was about two and a half, three years between when we walked off set to when it actually was shown. Wow. And the problem was the longer you wait when a movie's released, it gets this air, this this stench around it, that something's wrong, that the movie's failed, that it's not good. Perception goes out Yeah, the away. perception goes, yeah. That goes out the way. And the other thing is that it ends up on torrent sites, and everyone's already downloaded it a million times. And one of Terrence and I's thing was immediately, there's, we're not going to play that game. It's we're going to shoot it. We're not going to second guess ourselves. And that's the other problem is a lot of movies are overdeveloped. And there's so many people have notes and so many people have thoughts. Literally, our amazing editor, this, this, this chick Aaron Deck, who actually edited another movie that comes out, shameless plug, uh. next week called The Barons. She uh -huh. was an editor on that. Um, she literally had like a week and a half of, of editing when I actually got in the room. And that's, we didn't have like that 10 week edit thing. It was like, you got this amount of time and that's it. And then you're, we're done. And uh, we're not going to sit there and overthink this and show it to a million people and, and get a million different uh, ideas on it. it. This is all you have. There was, no, there was no cooks in the kitchen, but there also was no food in the kitchen. No. Right. <laughs> Mary, Mary a snack in the That's uh, why it's called room. starving artists. Yeah. Yeah. There's no food, yeah. but you're an artist. You yeah. guys have um, legions of cult-like fans on our chat right now, all volunteering to do your paperwork for you. Anytime you need some extra people, <laughs> they are all volunteering right now. Well, thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> My taxes still need to be filed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any good tax accounts out there. Might be a little too much there. information for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for we, we, we're, we're actually looking for a crooked doctor, a crooked lawyer, uh, <laughs> yeah. someone to save our, our wretched souls. Oh, that's <laughs> that's a big Hollywood list. Yeah. Uh, that's what's great, though, about the fans. I mean, just seeing them there. One thing that I've, I've realized, I think, that I never saw, I never had the ability, uh, pun intended, that I never had with the Saw films. I didn't realize the fandom then. Um, and I think because I was so, always an arm distance, there was always a studio between me and the fans. It was, I did the movie, I showed up to a premiere, I saw the trailers on TV, and it was cool. Um, but with, with Devil's Carnival, the, the fans and Repo have become the machine that, that drives it. Not the studio, it's the fans. It's the fans who um, have continued to allow us to make these things and do this and add more road tours. And Terrence and I are still, right now, we're back there still trying to plan a UK road tour for, for next month. So, it's, so we're, not, we're not done yet. It's all because of the insanity of the fans that show up in the chat room. And, and the musicals seem to have a different kind of fan base. I mean, it seems, going back to Rocky Horror, obviously, or yeah. Phantom of Paradise, there's, there's just a different kind of, it's like more interactive, I guess. They're not passive. Because it's musical. Well, I mean, I, I'd like to think it's, the music needs to be good. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think beyond that, um, I think you're much more inclined as an audience member to listen to an album over and over again as mm -hmm. opposed to watch a movie right. over and over again. Because it's like I some of my favorite films, I need to have space in between viewings. Right. But whereas an, an album or a soundtrack, you can listen to it over and over again. So I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it is um, the subversive musical that we're sort of, I guess, the evil stepfathers of, <laughs> for now at least. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, like, I personally have been listening to a lot of Nick Cave's murder ballads there lately. You go, yes. And I know that you are a Tom Waits fan who is totally. a storyteller, but very subversive. So I'm wondering, both of you, what are your musical influences as far as what touched you in bringing The Devil's Carnival as a musical to the audience? Uh, the Korean singer Psy with his Gangman style. <laughs> his, uh, yeah, there Should we, we go. Both there we go. <laughs> you know, uh, our fans have been asking for you guys to do the Gangnam dance since we first talked about it. Oh, Darren, 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 you guys are going to have to do that at some point. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the Gangnam style. Can you, can you cut me out of that frame, please? We just got a million hits from that one. That's going to go viral. Yeah. Musical influences, it changes It changes weekly. Murder by Death, I love. Um, Morphine, Tom Waits. Tom Morphine, I love um, him. I'm a huge Cake fan. I, I just find him hilarious. Um, Neil Diamond, uh, Johnny Cash. <laughs> Um, yeah, Johnny Cash. I mean, it's very dark. I don't really think that yeah. you know the public at large really realizes the deeper cuts are pretty dark. No, he he is, and he. I mean, he's. I love for that kind of the, the people that that song tell a complete story. Mm -hmm. Jim Croce was another yes. one. Yes. Um, when you listen to anything Jim Croce, there there is a story that he's telling within that. Absolutely. Um, Terrence. Well, you know, I think with this project or anything, there's a narrative for me as a songwriter. I try to. I try to find what the voice of the story is. And I think with this, the Sonicscape is very different than Repo, for example, which of course was futuristic. So uh, we used a lot of programming and samples and electronica. 
And this is Aesop Fables, so it needs to sound sort of ancient and not modern. And we made a very conscious choice to to use nothing electronic. It literally is like a live carny band. Hmm. Tuba is a central instrument. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I mean, so in that sense, I went looking for things like Kurt Vile. Um, you know, um, Sarah and I are fans of his work. And then yes, as a, Sarah Handelman, Sarah who, Handelman who the wrote these songs with you, yes. Yes, a longtime friend and amazing pianist. He is indeed. Um, Tom Waits, of course. Uh, <laughs> a pianist. A pianist. pianist. <laughs> <laughs> but Dresden Dolls, more modern. Oh, okay. um, and then, of course, vocalists that really inspire me. And I think the, the thing for that, and I try to emulate that, or at least live up to the expectation that your voice, whether that's through the songwriting or the performance, has a voice. And it's something like, no matter what the story, even if you're doing a cover, it sounds like it came from you. Absolutely. So, uh, like singers like Sam Cooke really move me. Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They call me peaches. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. No, but, but you, you, you also, but you work with in this uh, the Devil's Carnival. You work with Slipknot and Ogre and Five Finger uh, Death Punch. And so, did they want to bring their own twist on it as well, or did they respect you, know, you guys' vision? Too? This with Repo is a different story. I think with Repo, we had a lot of. Um, no one that was in the movie, but we, we had a lot of meetings and people wanted to, to bring their own uh, style into it. Right. Um, they wanted to, and some of them actually wanted to do their own lyrics, which oh. we, we thought was hilarious. Hmm. But we, it, 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 for a moment <laughs> there, we were very afraid it was going to become like an MTV mashup where everybody gotcha. just writes their own songs. But I think with this, because we, yeah. we had Repo, people kind of were involved because they liked Repo and they got it. They trusted um, what we were going to do. Yeah, and, so, and that's one of the reasons the thing grew. Hmm. Um, we ended up having what we thought was going to be like, 30 person crew ended up being a 100 person crew because people were like, we like what you guys did with Repo and we want to be a part of that sort of thing. And that, that included the crew and that included the cast. So it's, thankfully we're fans of their work, but I think in turn they're fans of our work. It's crazy. Um, we're gearing up right now and putting all the, it's, it's a huge undertaking to do one of these because you're recording an album, you're you know doing insane sets and this, this whole thing. We're, we're, so it takes a long time in pre-production. We've started part two started the early stages of, of talking about it and who we're going to cast. And it, we found it much easier to attract cast to something like this than ever if I was going to do another Barons or Saw film. And I think because you are offering them something that is kind of out there and different. And on top of that, we do have a, we have a, a fan base and a, you can go back and look at Repo and see what happened with it. You can go back now and look at Devil's Carnival and see what happened to it. And there's something kind of unique about that, which a lot of people don't get offered. Um, I don't know how often Dayton Callie from Sons of Anarchy, right, which right. I'm missing right now to be on here. So, uh, <laughs> He's amazing. Know, yes. is, uh, he doesn't get a lot of opportunities to come in and sing a song, or Sean Patrick Flannery does not get a chance to come in and do a power ballad. Yeah. And so I think that... I was um, going to actually, well that goes into the question I was going to ask you, which is which of the cast, the non-musical members, the actors most surprised you? Because for me, Mark Center was mm. a bit of a revelation. Cause yeah. He's I'm such a, an intense actor. I have a man crush on Mark Center, which I've talked about <laughs> numerous times. Um, I'm sure the fans are lighting up yeah. right now. Yeah, they are. They're going uh, crazy. No, but um, I, uh, I, I had a lot of his movies, and um, I kept trying to put him in things. I tried to put him in Mother's Day, and the, it didn't work out. And I was like, I promise I'm going to put you in something. And then you have that weird thing that you, you, you've built it up in your head so much, and I've talked about it for so much. And uh, what happens if he can't sing? Like, what right. if he can't sing? Mm -hmm. And so we got him in there, and it was awesome. Like, it, it, my man crush grew. Yeah, it's like <laughs> Grease. That part's like Grease. Yeah, like no, playing Scorpion, it's great. He's what was awesome, a uh, little, little factoid. So because he's not a singer, he was actually uncomfortable, at least mm. initially, in the same way that the, the musicians who play for these giant crowds and giant arenas were nervous about acting, because it's not mm. what they do right. every day. And uh, we brought him in, and of course, the pressure's on. Like, this is kind of your audition. Nate, Kill it, and kill it as a character who has to who has to exude confidence when you, maybe you're not feeling 100 percent confident. So he was in the uh, the recording booth laying down kind of his audition for us, and uh, and Laura Darren's wife was outside swooning over him. So we actually made him, her go into the booth with him, and we're like, sing it to Laura, ah. and then suddenly it came alive. Uh, Darren had to leave, of course, yeah. and, and go to the car and, and, and get the revolver. Just, and, still, <laughs> still, and, still just, and still to this day, Laura calls his name out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sex. As do you, right? I you both are calling out Mark's name. It's like, uh, Mark, Mark. We so shameless plugs as we continue. Guys, this October, October 23rd. October 23rd. You pre-order it now, and this is what's cool what we're doing. Is we, uh, I'm a fan of, of loaded DVDs, and so we have loaded for the last... Uh, We've, we have over two and a half hours, yeah. approaching oh, wow. three hours worth of behind the scenes footage, 
um, commentary. Stuff in the recording studio. Oh, stuff. No. You can actually stuff see Mark. On the tour. You can yeah. see Mark recording his song, and oh, you cool. get to see all. Can we stuff. see Laura? Uh, I, there's in the documentary about that Laura song. is awfully beautiful, uh, I have to say. I want to see Laura. But what's crazy what we're doing, what I'm excited about, what's working out, is we only made 6,660 um, of these special edition DVDs that have okay. all of the behind-the-scenes features on them. Now, they're available at Hot Topic, and this is something we haven't talked about. Hot Topic Disc also has a new soundtrack, which is a... 18-disc eight, expanded soundtrack. So I think sounds the initial wow. soundtrack, I think, was 12... Mm -hmm. um, 12 tracks, so it's expanded, it's got some score, um, some alternate versions of the songs, and some surprises that I think are going to make fans really excited. Uh, Becca has a couple questions from the chat room. Please. Yeah. We've been getting a ton. Yeah, um, we a lot of them. <laughs> this is one of my favorites okay, so far. Coming, coming in from Kelly, do each of you have a favorite Aesop fable? <sighs> Terrence, you've read all 600 and... Yeah, yeah they, do, they do sort of blend <laughs> together. I, um, I'm a boy who cried wolf one, too. The ghost. I'm, I'm sorry. That would be your favorite. I know. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I think a moral that stuck out to me, and I actually answered this in an interview with you, Stacey, at one point, yes. was uh, Flashback. Pride cometh before the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that, that stuck to mm -hmm. me a little bit, so I try to remember that, especially when we're out on the road. That seems like for the Archangel, too, right? That seems like that uh, would well, be... It, it, it matches Lucifer, yeah, definitely. It's, it's so, uh, I try not to read whenever possible. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> they're very short, though. Uh, they're so lazy. Yeah. 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 They're two lines. Yeah. 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 Do you have the another Twitter one? Yeah, I do. Um, I, this is another one from Kelly, which I just think is a great question. If you guys decided to run away and join the circus, what jobs would you choose and why? Uh, great question. Huh. Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Um, I don't think I have any circus I, skills, but I'd want to do something maybe like pick up hot chicks. <laughs> <laughs> strong man. Strong, strong man. man. Strong He's strong man. man. You, you have to be ringmaster, right? I was a carnival barker. Yeah, I think well, it's similar, sounds, yeah. yeah, I think it's mm. it's fun. The director, that's yeah. Uh, a knife thrower would be pretty badass, though, too. Yeah, that would be the, that would be. But fun. That requires skill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just depends if you want to be a good one. That's true. That's true. Um, we have we definitely want to touch on this question before we move on. Uh, the look of the Devil's Carnival and also the look of Satan are, are very very unique. I'm wondering what you guys kind of maybe base some of those ideas on. Um, a lot of it had to do with budget, um, <laughs> but it, honestly. <laughs> but 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 we here's the thing: we knew how much money we had going in, and we we had an opportunity. We had an option at that point. We can try to make it look bigger than it was, or we can embrace what we had. And I think what we did is we embraced what we had, and we looked at all around us and said, "Okay, we have this amazing carnival set. We have these amazing people, and we we set that, and that's what we did. Instead of trying to make it bigger than we had and having big CGI worlds and things like that, we wanted it all to be practical. We wanted it to be real. We wanted it to be tangible that you could touch. That being said, that's augmented by CGI. Um, but it's, you know, it was, we looked at our resources, and we brought back Joe, uh, Joe White, who was the cinematographer who did Repo, who did Mother's Day, who did The Barons. Again, coming out next Friday. Uh, we have a question about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll we, we brought them back, and I think that uh, my favorite, one of my favorite movies is Dick Tracy. Oh, yeah. um, and we used Storaro Gels, who is the same gel pattern and DP of, of Dick Tracy, huh. which is the same, same gels we used in Repo. I just love those very colorful, bright looks. Well, specifically with Lucifer, with the devil, yeah. we went around the horn quite a bit. And obviously, I think when it comes to characters I'm playing, I have the least clarity when it mm. comes to the, the look. Um, so uh, we put a lot of trust in the hands of the awesome makeup and effects team uh, run by Vincent Guastini. And I'm really happy with the end result. But the basic idea was we battle a lot with should Lucifer look human? Should he be like demonic or somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and we ultimately decided, one, he needed to be otherworldly, especially with how everyone else looked in it. But he needed to look like he was of the carnival. So they had this idea that uh, naturally, as a carny, he's a showman himself. He's a performer. So they worked in basically like um, old Coney Island style posters mm -hmm. of, of jesters and devils and, and incorporated a clown type mask on top of Lucifer's red skin. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool look. I'm very it's, happy with it. At some point, we're going to have to talk about what the devil was I mean, the whole back and forth of what the yeah. devil. I don't think it's at the time because it's too long. But <laughs> there was a, at another time, maybe yeah. at, a, at a bar somewhere. Uh -huh. We'll explain after what the show. devil. Well, was. We can always do an after. <laughs> show. Yeah, exactly. I do have a still right. of legend. Let's pull up the still of legend. Uh, 
with yeah. So oh, showing yes. at least like the horns. Uh-huh. So I imagine yeah, yeah. you guys were Tim Curry fans. But, of but see, yeah. th- those are fake pecs. Mine were yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> you do look like a bit more hoboish with the clothes yeah. and yeah. stuff. Well, I, 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 what... I preferred like a Hugh Hefner okay. sort okay. of uh, gotcha. storyteller. Yeah. Yes, yes, the silk robe really sold it. The silk robe, it. yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> time, time is against us, but we will ask uh, about the new Barons. Yes. Uh, about the new film Barons looks like a great cast. Uh, one of my favorite actresses ever. Uh, yeah. From Exotica, yeah. Well, Ever maker, since Exotica, yes. I've been drooling. Um, <laughs> but the question I want to ask, not just about the film, but also about how people can see it, because this is another active yeah. participation. Well, game. yeah, it's, um, you know, the distribution model is changing daily, and I think that we as filmmakers are trying to run to catch up with it. Um, this is a day, basically, it's it's released in a couple of cities. L.A. is one of them. Uh, you can see it at the Chinese, if you're in L.A., the Chinese man, uh, next Friday. It's also available via Tug, and... I was kind of against that whole idea. I didn't understand how it worked. And recently, though, it's it's been working. I think we're we have seven different now tug events yeah. that are up. So it's in like Atlanta, in New Jersey, Kansas, uh, a couple of other places, Texas maybe. Um, you can request it via tug. If you make the criteria, you get the screening. Uh, and then the next week, you can get it on VOD and then DVD. So it's it's a it's a numerous different things that people can can go out and find the movie. But it's great. It's Stephen Moyer. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a really dark drama, I would say. I don't know if I'd go out and say it's a monster. There's a monster in it, yes. The Barons. Uh, it's the, the legend of the Jersey Devil. But it's more about someone's descent into madness. Stephen Moyer. He's fantastic. I was a Moyer fan, but I add him to my man crushes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Another name to shout out. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. Now, Terrence, I have been following the molting since it was an idea in your little head. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So now you have which issue is coming out? You've got a brand new one. Well, I'm very excited to announce that yes. after taking a hiatus with, from the molting to uh-huh. do the Devil's Carnival. Right. Um, good reason. A good reason, yeah. <laughs> I'm, Not uh, for rehab or anything. Well, <laughs> it's all, it, it all blends together at some point. Uh, no. But issue number seven of the Molten comic, uh, Supernatural Aid, is printed. I think and we have a cover. Can we pull up the oh cover? Oh, yeah, let's look at that. That artwork is it'll incredible. Be incredible. Yeah, there you go. Yes. It'll be available October 2nd at themoltencomic.com. So pick it up. It's another big one in my 12-part series. It's a 60-page issue Wow. Uh, that deals with uh, religion and the supernatural. So I'm very Ooh. excited to release it to the public, and I hope they enjoy it. October 2nd. Cool, and uh, before, so we're, what we're going to do is we'll stay on when the episode ends in a couple minutes and ask you guys some of the fan questions to make sure that they can still ask you if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, It'll be quick. Sure. But we have three quick questions we like to ask before yes. you leave the studio. I saw very a fast. little devious smirk. You did. Like, <laughs> well, these are easy questions. These are very, they're making fast. Stacy look away. We should oh. be. <laughs> when you get to the pearly gates, what do you want them to say? No, it's not really? uh, no this one's easy. <laughs> it's not a James Lipton thing. Uh, your first scary movie that you remember seeing. Terror Train. Uh, the Exorcist. Uh, that's a really All scary. right. And what do you fear? <sighs> My phone Again, pride, pride goeth before the fall. Um, <laughs> I fear not being able to finish whatever I've started. So my work, my art in particular, um, the molting creates a lot of anxiety for me because I know <laughs> it's a 12-issue thing that I've set up to do. It's like and I've, I have, yeah, I have, well, the roaches are part of it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I have fears that my roach hand, my drawing hand, might get lopped off before it's over, and I don't know if I have time to learn how to draw with my feet. <laughs> <laughs> and Darren? Um, abandonment and mm. being alone. I yeah. think that... Um, there's that great Twilight Zone episode where the guy wants to, he just wants time to read the book. I and then, love uh, that one. That yeah, is one of my that's, faves. But that's, I think that's, that's probably what it is. It's, it's waking up one day and being completely by myself. You'll always have the fan base, so that's something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this one, this doing one, our paperwork very yeah. soon. Yeah. <laughs> this one I, I wrote just for you guys today. Uh, the film you watched the most on VHS. VHS. But, so think back. Which one did you burn through? La Bamba. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Rage of the Lost Ark. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a classic. You would come up with when I said La Bamba? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but your musical arts are yeah, yeah. Look, it all ties yeah. together. There you go. Yes. La Bamba. Yes. Uh, Ricky Valens. And, you know, he died too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, God. Oh, what do you too? Darren is still did. very much with us. <laughs> uh, well, we've run out of time in our regular show, but we're going to try to get to some of your answers. Uh, so mm-hmm. stick around for the next few minutes. Yep. Uh, we want to thank these guys. It was really great seeing you again. And, yeah. Thank you for having Please, us. Please, guys, go to www.thedevilscarnival.com. Pre-order mm-hmm. one of the 6,660 discs. We're down to 
It was crazy. We've actually uh, we went on sale last week, two weeks ago, and we only have a couple thousand left, which is oh, pretty man, awesome. Oh man, I better so, hurry. But they're but, very cool, and they come with a collector's book inside, and they're numbered. And it's if you're a fan, it'll be worth it. We, we might need to sign one of the DVD soundtrack, uh, one of the soundtracks you brought. Maybe get a sign one that maybe we'll sure. be yes. with that. Although you're already giving it away. I know. Well, well, I'll, I'll burn it. I'll burn it for myself. And then, uh, I'm keeping mine, I swear. Uh, and so uh, keep, keep an eye on our Facebook page We're about the victim giveaway. Yes. And next week, we are very excited. We will be joined in studio by the writer of Jaws, Carl Gottlieb. So that will be really interesting. Yep. So get your questions ready for that. So thanks for uh, letting us come back. We're excited to be here. Uh, make sure you check out this great film uh, because Devil's, Re uh, De Devil's Reject. Devil's Carnival. <laughs> <laughs> Devil's Reject. Uh, their film doesn't have Sid Haig, so you know. It does. Have Bill it does. Yes, there is crossover. And Bill Mosley sings, so that's yeah. probably better. You that's win. That's awesome. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week.
Okay, are we good? Welcome uh, back, everybody. We're going to be asking some questions from the chat because there are so many of you guys out there. And I would first just like to thank some of the people who have been with us this whole time. Um, Lost Schizophrenic, um, 3D Loki, K-Pay, am I saying that right? Um, Julius, Jutton, you guys have been phenomenal and I've been reading your comments the whole time. So now we're going to backtrack and try to get to a couple of them. Um, so the first one that really kind of struck me as we were going along that I was amused by is um, the fans really want to know, and they really loved this question, and it spurred a lot of commentary. If you were ever asked to do a repo version of Glee, if Glee ever proposed a repo episode, would you do it? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Terrence probably has a different answer, but here's the thing is I make fun of Glee, but I've actually watched the first two seasons, and the fact is this. Is it? It's a good gateway drug. Um, it, it is. I, I think that you could get to a whole other audience that once they see the Glee episode of Repo, they would actually go back and watch the real episode of Repo, and then find the Devil's Carnival, and then maybe Cannibal Holocaust, and keep going down the degenerate <laughs> dirtbag hole. So I think I think you'd be shooting yourself in the foot not wow. to on something like that. But so Terrence? which 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 cast member of Glee would be the Paris Hilton role, though? We must know. You know what? I would put uh, Sue. Because uh, I think she'd be hilarious, or the uh, the I forget her name, but the uh, uh, coach, the gym coach, the big uh, awesome. Yeah, yes, yeah. I'm sure Paris would love. The cool thing would be if Bill Mosley was in Glee. Uh, Bill yeah. Mosley's in Glee. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> Terrence, what would you do if someone came to you from Glee and said we want to do a repo episode? I've never seen Glee. You know what? You know what? That's wrong. Wait, everyone, I'm going to tell you a story. One time, Terrence did see Glee. He was at my house, and oh, Laura right. and I were so watching it. it. And he got so angry, he stood up and left, <laughs> literally left. And uh, one last thing is another funny story. Joe Bashara, for those of you that uh, are fans of us, will know who Joe Bashara is. One time, he came over to my house, and I was watching Enchanted, the uh, romantic comedy. <laughs> oh, he no. literally he stared at the screen for like 30 seconds. He's like, I'm leaving. And I'm like, what? He's like, I can't be here. And he just turned off and left. <laughs> so, but I did uh, notice he stayed for uh, Salo at that one party oh, that yeah, you he'll, had. He'll sit and watch Salo all night, but he's not going to watch uh, Enchanted. <laughs> Uh, when people come to my house, I have uh, weird things on the TV, and uh, we had Sallow on one time. And for those mm -hmm. that have not seen it, I don't recommend renting it. It's, uh, it's pretty hard. I don't hard. recommend it either, I must it's say. A, it's a pretty hard no. film. It's a little intense for, like, a communal <laughs> viewing also. Have you seen it? Uh, I have. Oh. I have. It's the one movie, I think, literally, that I've had to fast forward watching. I can't, I can't. When it gets to that last 12 minutes, I have a hard time. A really hard time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, from Garbage Pail Rejects, we, they want to know, wow. and I love this the name. a very intelligent question. I can't <laughs> wait. Yes. It's going to be smart. They actually, it's a pretty insightful one. Um, since you've been on tour all over the country and you've had, you know, hundreds of fans, thousands of fans asking you thousands of questions, what is the one question that you have been asked repeatedly that you are just so sick of answering? 
I love how that's so passive aggressive. You know, right, it's like, right. we don't want to ask you something you don't want to answer. So we'll get you to do it on what your own. What shouldn't we ask you anymore? It's like, here's the noose. <laughs> Let's see if it fits. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know if, it, it, the question that's been asked the most, and I don't know if this, I'm tired of answering it, actually, because it shows that fans are excited. Uh, we get asked almost nightly, will there be a Repo 2? Mm -hmm. and, um, and we kind of always say the same answer, which is, um, well, firstly, we don't own Repo anymore. Lionsgate owns Repo. So as much as we'd love to play in that world some more, um, it's not really up to us. So instead of, instead of waiting or asking for permission and hoping that Lionsgate might come around and go, hell yeah, let's do another one of these, we said, um, let's just take control of our own destinies. And that's where the Devil's Carnival was born. So hopefully, once the Devil's Carnival is out there on DVD on mm -hmm. October 23rd, yes, which you can buy at www.thedevilscarnival.com. <laughs> no, really? No, wow, once you say that, people will be saying, "When this. can I see Devil's Carnival episode two? Uh, and and we'll, we'll have an answer for that actually. Oh, so you'll be revealing that. You know what's so? You know what's so? I'm going to tell everyone at home that's watching this right now, which is one of the most horrific things to do, is uh, see yourself in your gut, and you're trying to reposition yourself so the gut <laughs> is not. So, so I'm trying to pull my shirt down and like cross my legs in a way. Uh, yeah, I'm on a juice cleanse right now, and uh, <laughs> I'm on. I'm, I'm very anxious and angry right oh, see, now. I thought you didn't like me. I thought yeah, that's what. Yeah, by, by juice cleanse, he's actually yeah, using it to like uh, <laughs> clean the tiles. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I was scrubbing my uh, my bathroom tiles with bleach again, trying to get those red stains out, oh, yeah. and uh, I found a juice cleanse works wonders. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Darren, everybody is saying that you look great. Oh, you well, do thank look you. great. So thank you very feel much. good. You um, know how you can lose five Another pounds? great question yeah, um, great. that has come up is there what from Looking April good. Hudson? What is the most frightening thing that's happened to you guys? Like ever? Uh, like in your life? What is the scariest thing that's ever happened? Um, well, it was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. But recently, uh, someone broke into our house when we were asleep. Oh wow! And, uh, oh my gosh. We. Uh, <laughs> we luckily, I had the, uh, my assistant was uh, staying there from 11-11, uh, another movie I did. He's from Spain, doesn't speak very good English. And so he comes in my room and we wake up and he's standing over the bed and he goes, he goes, someone break in your house. And I was like, what? And he's like, in your house now, breaking in. And I was like, <laughs> and I, it took me a while to process what he was saying. And then I jumped up, we ran out in the front room and there were three dudes that were, uh, that was pretty scary. Oh they gosh. ran away. Yeah. But uh, that was, that was pretty scary. Well, wow. especially given that you made Mother's Day a home invasion film. I know, and that's all I thought. I was yeah. like, this is it. This is like, I'm going to get my comeuppance yeah. right now. Yeah, right. No, that's no, scary. Really no is. tea kettles, please. Yeah. Gosh, that was one scene that really got me, Darren. That the, tea, the kettle. tea kettle scene? Oh, yeah. my God. Yes. Terrence? Um, I don't know if I have like, a scariest story, but I definitely have a story that was super intense. And it was one of those moments where death seemed like possibly a good option. <laughs> and wow. that was... Uh, <laughs> as opposed to the, the pain. <laughs> I was, uh, I'm not much of a swimmer. Actually, I, I don't really like the water. And for some stupid reason, a teenage version of me uh, decided to jump in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, when there were like red flags up and warnings don't go in. So I was young and dumb and said, oh, pff, I can conquer the ocean. And I, I went out swimming and got caught in like the undertow or whatever it's called. And I spent the next what seemed like 15 minutes just fighting, trying to get back to the shore. And I remember feeling like every muscle, every, it was just exhausted to the point where I felt like I couldn't go any further. And I kept just getting thrown down under the water. And obviously, I was lucky at some point, the wave just spit me back past the point where I was over the hump. But there was a moment where I was just fighting, 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 fighting. And I was so exhausted thinking this is it hmm. and had that brief moment where it was kind of like maybe it's okay hmm. and then right. i said no no fuck that <laughs> I'm, I'm swimming the shit out of here <laughs> and so therefore the scorpion and the frog yeah. <laughs> there you go the and all my mind. dreams i drown yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one more you yeah know, well this one? has been the biggest question on the chat so far everybody wants to know about devil's carnival too when's it coming what's in it what um, of the, the episodes, which one of the Aesop's fables are you touching on? Cast, I've been getting so many questions about that. So just cover it all in a couple of minutes. Uh, no. <laughs> and, and thank you, we're done. We give away our secret recipe. <laughs> um, well, uh, to serve man, it's a cookbook. Terrence, I mean, to, to kind of echo a little bit what Terrence and I were talking about earlier, 
it's been a non-stop sprint since we got off the road tour. There's been no stopping. There's been no uh, taking of the vacation yet. It's been literally getting the DVD ready. Um, and from, from pulling the footage to editing the footage to getting the approval of the footage to contracts, there's really been no time to stop. And we're just now getting to the point that we're actually pulling out the calendar and trying to arrange everyone's schedule for episode two. Episode two is happening. That's, I think I can firmly say that it is happening. Um, that's pretty much all I can say from this point. Let's Terrence, you want to? Yeah, I mean, we don't want to give away casting or, any, or the fables yet. Um, but needless mm -hmm. to say, the next three fables have been picked out. Um, and some of the ca some of the cast. Members. And some of the cast. But I, I'll talk a little bit about the style, and this is sort of exciting, I think, for both of us. And that is, episode two takes place in heaven as opposed to hell, mm. which was the first one took place. So we're developing a very different look for heaven. Uh, and a very different sound musically for Heaven. And so I'm pretty excited as, uh, as a composer to explore new territory. And we touched upon it a little bit with Paul Servino in episode one. But the basic concept is, in Hell, it's, it's the kids' music. It's where everyone's down there partying, having a good time. Upstairs is kind of what your grandparents are listening to. But that said, it's going to be much more subversive and possibly even darker than hell. So you're going to have a feeling of, wow, this sounds like old-timey happy music, right. but, but you're being oppressed to it entirely. Well, so for, I'm excited. It, we'll end the note on a Paul Servinoism because it's, it's, <laughs> it is God. Uh, two of my favorite moments recently have come both from Paul Servino. There's going to be a little special treat hitting soon that involves some of the repo people, and what Paul Servino does in it is pretty hilarious. But <laughs> Paul Servino in the commentary track, there's a commentary track, the Repo Reunion, Commentary track. I love that already. Well, I let's wait to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul Servino, it never fails to entertain. Well, I can tell you one thing. I, if, if nothing else, you'll be entertained <laughs> by the Repo Reunion commentary track in Mr. Oh, Servino. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, guys, thank you so much. Uh, if I can get one last on the chat room, hail Satan. <laughs> well, what will you guys do if it's in heaven? What will everyone do at the show? What, like, hail? Praise be to the Lord! Praise, <laughs> Praise the Lord! Where do you see we have an idea? Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks thanks so much for joining Thank us, guys. You. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. You. All right. Good. Thanks so much for staying. Yes. See you all next week. I think that will make your days. Yeah. Uh, yeah, next week absolutely. we have um, guests from Jaws, right? Yep. Writer Jaws. We have the writer of Jaws joining and us. Steven so Spielberg tune in next week, guys. See you later. <laughs>